Aye. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And at the last First Minister's questions before Christmas, may I wish all members and people across Scotland all the compliments of the season. And in a spirit of goodwill, may I ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day? First Minister. Presiding Officer, may I also wish you, the Chamber and everybody across the country a very, very happy Christmas and a good new year. Uh, and uh, reciprocating that spirit of goodwill, I can advise the Chamber that later today I will have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland, plus probably a spot of Christmas shopping. <laughs> Thank you. Presiding officer, in the last 90 minutes, the Auditor General has reported back on the Scottish Police Authority. For the third year running, she has cited weak management and financial leadership. She describes it as unacceptable. How does the First Minister put it? First Minister. I actually agree with the conclusion uh, that the Auditor General has reached in the report published this morning. She says uh, the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland uh, have taken steps to improve financial leadership and uh, governance and arrangements, but these arrangements have not yet had a chance to have an impact. So Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority are working to improve uh, their financial management, and I think that's something the Chamber should support. Uh, for the part of the Scottish Government, we, of course, are working with the Police Authority and with Police Scotland to ensure the financial sustainability of policing in the years ahead. That's why, in the draft budget, we have put forward a real terms uh, increase in protection for the resource budget of uh, the Scottish Police Authority and an increase in the capital budget, continuing also the reform budget, uh, which is all intended to put the police uh, in, on a good financial footing so that they can continue the excellent work that they do. Ruth Davison. I note the First Minister's reply and we'll get to the budget in a second, but let's just spell out the report itself. Last year, the Auditor General said that there was a potential funding gap of £84 million by 2018-19. This year, we learned that the cumulative funding gap that our police service may face over the course of this parliament is now running at £190 million. Poor leadership is responsible, says Audit Scotland. It says that there are inaccurate financial records and that the Scottish Police Authority is failing to provide information about what money is actually being spent on. And the Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary report also out this morning says that urgent work is still needed to improve the way public funds are being spent. So does the First Minister really have confidence that this is a system that is working or indeed improving? First Minister. Well, the Auditor General said in the Section 22 report published this morning, uh, and I quoted this in uh, response to Ruth Davidson's earlier question, that the SPA and Police Scotland uh, are taking steps to improve financial leadership and governance arrangements, uh, but these have not yet had a chance to have an impact. So that's the conclusion of the Auditor General, and it's one that I support. In terms of the wider uh, budget issues, as I've said, we are protecting the resource budget of the Scottish Police Authority uh, in real terms. That is important given the challenges facing our police service. We're also ensuring a real terms increase in the capital budget and the reform budget, which of course uh, should have ended completely completely by now is being continued to assist the police with the ongoing uh, work of reform. Uh, the police are also working, as members will be aware, on their long-term strategic plan and associated financial strategy as part of the Policing 2026 uh, programme. I uh, met with the Chief Constable and the Chair of the Police Authority earlier this month to discuss their progress with that work. Uh, so we'll continue to work with and support the police as they face up to the challenges ahead. But can I say this? Uh, one final thing, Presiding Officer. There would right now uh, be an additional £25 million a year available to the police if the Conservatives don't like to hear this. There would be £25 million a year extra available to invest in our police if the United Kingdom government did not insist on making Police Scotland the only police authority in the entirety of the UK to have to pay that. So will Ruth Davidson get behind our calls to stop that? Ruth Davidson. The charges from the Auditor General are weak financial leadership, inaccurate records and poor financial management. Running to Westminster bad is not exactly going to cut it, First Minister. But, do you know, there's something 
terribly familiar about, about all the responses we've had so far today. What well, we've got is it's terribly regrettable, it's all in the past, we're going to do better. But let me read out the reaction from the Scottish Government to last year's report from the Auditor General saying exactly the same thing, which was the commitments given in this week's draft budget will put the police budget on a sustainable footing for future years. A year on and Police Scotland is now staring down the barrel of a £190 million budget deficit. We've heard it all before. But there are an issue I want to come on specifically from the two reports today, and that is transparency. The Auditor General says that there is very limited publicly available detail to provide, provided to the P Police Authority Board on how it spends its money. And let me just read verbatim from the report. The Scottish Police Authority allocated £972.9 million to Police Scotland for 2016-17. There was very little publicly available detail provided to the SPA board in its papers about what this allocation was to deliver. In other words, nearly a billion pounds of funds handed to Police Scotland without us knowing what it was for. Does the First Minister find this as extraordinary as I do? First Minister. So the billion pounds that we invest in our police provide the police officers the length and breadth of this country that keep this country safe. If Ruth Davidson doesn't know what the police budget is for, then I suspect she does a bit more homework in future before she comes to this chamber. But let me return, let me return to, and of course there are a thousand more police officers across this country as a result of the investment and commitment of this government. But let me return to the Audit Scotland report and uh, when I quoted it earlier on I was doing exactly that, uh, quoting the Auditor General uh, and I'll do it again, it's the conclusion of the report published this morning. The SPA and Police Scotland have begun to take steps to improve both financial leadership and management and government arrangements but these haven't yet had a chance to have an impact. That's not my view, that is the view of the Auditor General. Now, I would expect the SPA and Police Scotland to act on all of the recommendations made by Audit Scotland and by Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary. But I noticed the one point Ruth Davidson did not address in her question there was the VAT position, because this is material. You know, the UK government, the UK government tells us that because the police service in Scotland is funded by central government, then it's got to pay VAT. But when the UK government decided to set up academy schools in England and fund them from central government, do we know what it did? It then amended the VAT Act in order to exempt academy schools from VAT. So there is £25 million pounds £25 million pounds a year right now that should be going to our police service that is currently going to the Treasury. And Ruth Davidson will not have any credibility standing here talking about, about police until she backs us in telling her Tory colleagues in Westminster to do the right thing and stop taking money out of the pockets of our police service. Ruth Davidson. warned about VAT, they knew it would happen, they didn't listen to Parliament and you know the First Minister is in trouble but she can't answer for herself, she runs the Westminster bad. But twice today, twice today the First Minister has stood up and talked about the increasing police budget so let's have a look at that because I want to challenge her on that. The Scottish Government is claiming that the policing budget is going up by £7 million in real terms but like everything else in last week's budget it's not quite what it seems. The reform budget, which was at £55 million last year, was reduced to £36 million for this year. Now, we asked the Scottish Police Federation about this, and they say that despite its name and what the First Minister tries to claim, this budget is crucial in terms of service delivery. So, in fact, far from increasing the amount of money the single force has by £7 million, it appears the SNP is actually cutting it by almost £12 million. So, can I just ask, on top of cuts to councils and double counting, isn't this just another stealth cut that is emerging from Derek Mackay's slightly unravelling budget? First Minister. 
The resource budget of the Scottish Police Authority is not increasing by £7 million, as Ruth Davidson says. It's increasing by £19 million, real terms protection for the resource budget. The capital budget is going up by just under £4 million, uh, also a real terms increase. That is the reality. Now, Ruth Davidson talks about the reform budget. The reform budget should have been completely ended, I think, two financial years ago. Instead of that, we have continued the support through the reform budget to assist the police in making the reforms that they need. But let's come back to the nub of this issue. We've got Ruth Davidson standing up here again, as she does week after week after week, asking for more money for the police, for the health service, for education. Where is that money coming from? Because the only criticism last week that Ruth Davidson wanted to make about our budget is that we weren't given big enough tax cuts to the richest earners in Scotland. So here is the incoherence, the incoherence and the inconsistency at the heart of the Tory proposition. Tax cuts for the rich, but standing up here asking for more money for every single public service. But of course, presiding officer, there is a potential source of additional money for our police service, as we know. And what Ruth Davidson has just stood up and conceded is that the UK government's refusal to exempt our police service from VAT is nothing more than political spite. Absolutely. They can do it. They can do it for academy schools in England, but they will not do it for police services across Scotland. That is absolutely despicable, and the Tories should be ashamed of themselves. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. And on behalf of the Labour Party, can I wish everybody a very Merry Christmas <laughs> and a Happy New Year? And in that spirit, ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. Uh, engagement to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. This morning, Audit Scotland published a damning report into Scotland's police bodies. And this is a report that was laid before Parliament. The decision to publish this report little more than two hours before we break for the Christmas holidays was the Scottish Government. Can I ask the First Minister, what was she trying to hide? First Minister. The report... The report requires to be laid before Parliament by the 31st of December each year. The accounts were only approved by the SPA board uh, last Thursday afternoon. So we have published the report to give Parliament uh, due chance to consider it. And I think the evidence, the evidence that Parliament is able to properly consider and scrutinise it is right before us today, given that the opposition leaders are asking questions about it. Exactly. This is the First Minister who time and time again in this chamber promises us openness and transparency. She tells us, she tells us that she respects Parliament and this is how she treats it. This is a serious report about the state of our police. Absolutely. The Auditor General estimates that the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland could face a funding gap of almost £190 million pounds by the end of this Parliament. And this will cause considerable alarm in communities across Scotland. And rather than having a force that is committed to keeping our communities safe, we have one that is desperately trying to balance the books. When will the First Minister realise that our public services are in crisis? First Minister. Firstly, on the timing of the report, as I said, we have until 31st of December to publish uh, and lay this report. The fact that it has been done, and it is a nine-page report. I think even the opposition can manage to read a nine-page report in an hour and a half before First Minister's questions. The fact that it has been published this morning gives, <coughs> gives order, every order, opposition leader order. the chance to ask questions at First Minister's questions as they are doing. Now, in terms of the, in terms of the financial position of the police. As I have already said, the resource budget of the police is being protected in real terms. The capital budget of the police is increasing, uh, I think, by more than uh, a real terms 
increase. We are continuing support through the reform budget and we are continuing to make the case for the police no longer having to pay VAT in the way that no other police authority across the country has to pay VAT. So can I ask the Labour Party today, will they support us in asking the Tories to stop taking money out of the pockets of our police? Kezia Dugdale. Oh, we can read it in 90 minutes, First Minister. It's a shame it took you a week. <laughs> and if the First Minister, if the First Minister had any confidence in this report, she wouldn't have published it two hours before the Christmas recess. And as the year draws to a close, it's a good time to look back at the SNP's record. The NHS and the police in crisis. School standards are slipping and the budget is unravelling in slow motion. SNP MSPs should be embarrassed by this budget, not queuing up to get copies of it signed. There is a shortfall of £200 million in the police service and this is a service she says she is protecting. God help our schools and hospitals. The truth is the SNP is cutting £327 million from local services. When will the First Minister use the powers of this Parliament and do the right thing? Stop the cuts. First Minister. Well, if Labour... In the unlikely event that Labour had won the election, the NHS budget would be going up by inflation. Absolutely. Under this government, it will go up by £500 million exactly. more exactly. than inflation. Exactly. And in terms of funding for local services, funding for local services in terms of the draft budget will increase by £240 million. Pounds. That includes £120 million pounds more for our schools. It includes an extra £107 million pounds for social care to provide the services that we need in order to alleviate the pressure on our National Health Service. Uh, so this is a budget about protecting public services. And if we want to look back on the... If we want to look back on the relative records of different parties over the past year, then the crowning glory of Kezia Dugdale has been to lead her party to 15% in the opinion poll. I know we're nearing the end of the session, but can members please just listen to each other? A couple of supplementaries. The first from Bob Doris. Um, thank you, President Officer. First Minister, I recently met with a group of single parents from Mary Hill who have raised serious concerns with me over the planned closure of the local job centre by the UK Department of Work and Pensions. Plans currently out to consultation. Concerns include the distance, cost and time taken to travel to alternative job centre in Springburn, a poor employability service, potential additional sanctions and the impact on schooling and childcare, to name but a few. Can I ask the First Minister to make representations to the UK Government over any concerns it may share over how vulnerable groups may be impacted by the proposed closures and whether she agrees with me that it would be best for the current DWP proposals to close eight job centres across Glasgow were abandoned by Job Centre Plus and a fundamental review rethink over how best to support vulnerable groups within the city? First Minister. Well, Bob Doris raises very real concerns. They are concerns I share, not least because these changes, if they were to go ahead, would affect my own constituents and the south side of Glasgow as well. Now, I know Jamie Hepburn, the Minister for Employability and Training, has already raised uh, concerns over the impact of these changes on vulnerable groups in Glasgow, and in particular how these changes could reduce access to services and result in additional costs for those who have to travel further to access them. He's also seeking urgent clarification on the future of Job Centre Plus facilities across the, the rest of the country, not just Glasgow. I understand that DWP has extended its consultation plans until the 31st of January, uh, and I've asked uh, Jamie Hepburn to again ensure that the views of the Scottish Government are expressed clearly and directly to DWP ministers by that date. David Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The epicentre of Storm Barbara will be in the Highlands and Islands, where winds of up to 90 miles an hour will destroy property, cut power lines and dislocate road, rail, ferry and air services. Is the First Minister confident that the transport system is prepared for and resilient enough to cope with the forthcoming severe weather? First Minister. 
Uh, well, the member raises important issues of, of concern. Uh, the Scottish Government resilience arrangements have been activated already to ensure that Scotland is as prepared as possible for the severe weather expected across the rest of this week. The relevant authorities have activated their plans to deal with any potential impacts and extra staffing and on-call arrangements are in place over the festive period. Uh, yesterday, the Minister for Transport and the Islands chaired a meeting with key partners to discuss the Scottish Government resilience arrangements and will continue to chair the daily adverse weather meetings going forward. Uh, public safety, of course, remains our absolute top priority. I would urge people to listen to the latest advice on local radio and digital channels and obviously to check before they travel. And Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and still on storms. As we approach the anniversary of Storm Frank, an estimated 70 families have still not returned to their homes, and Aberdeenshire Council has spent over 11 million on the clean-up bill. Presiding Officer, the residents of Ballater and Kemney are feeling forgotten, flood repairs inadequate or non-existent, and are rightly concerned they are still at risk this winter. So can the First Minister reassure them that the Scottish Government is doing all it can to protect them and their families from future floods? First Minister. Uh, yes, yes, I can, and it's an important issue. Um, I know, uh, and I saw much of this uh, with my own eyes uh, this time last year, the damage uh, that flooding did to many individuals and indeed many uh, businesses across both the northern parts of the country and uh, the southern parts of the country as well. I can assure the member that those affected and those who are still out of their homes as a result of the damage that was done last year have not been forgotten. Uh, the Scottish Government has been uh, with uh, our partners and local authorities and will continue to do everything we possibly can, uh, both to ensure that the damage for those affected is dealt with and they get back into their homes as quickly as possible but also through our flood risk management planning uh, we reduce because we can never eliminate but we reduce the risk of it happening in the future. Question number three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Apex Scotland has 30 years experience working in prisons. Its chief executive says that a majority of young offenders have a mental health condition. Yet he also says access to mental health services is poor or non-existent. The latest figures show that attempted suicides at Paul Mint Young Offenders Institute went up sixfold in just one year. Apex Scotland say mental health services for young offenders are being left far behind just like the rest of the country. Can the First Minister give me a guarantee that mental health services for young offenders will change? First Minister. Uh, that is certainly the intention uh, of the Scottish Government. I, I actually agree with Willie Rennie. If mental health services generally, and this is not a new thing, this is a generations old issue, if mental health services generally have tended to be the Cinderella service, then that is particularly true uh, when talking about and dealing with young offenders in our prisons. Uh, it is absolutely the case that many people, particularly young people who find themselves in prison, will suffer from mental health issues. It is therefore incumbent on all of us to make sure that they have access uh, to good quality mental health services to deal with what are often the underlying causes of their offending. I've said before in this chamber many times, and I will say it again, uh, we are seeing an increase, <coughs> a substantial increase in demand for mental health services, uh, and we should recognise that as a positive in terms of the reducing stigma associated with mental health, but we have an absolute obligation to make sure that we can meet that rising demand. That is why our mental health strategy is so important, why we're taking so much time and care and making sure we get that right, but also why the additional investment that we have planned in mental health services is so important as well. William Rennie. The problem for the First Minister is that that mental health strategy doesn't even mention mental health services for young offenders. Not one mention within it. I have told her before that many organisations think the strategy is just not good enough. Marie Curie said there is nothing for the terminally ill. It has been criticised by the RCN, the psychiatrists, and by a whole lot of charities. The £10 million announced at the weekend was a drop in the ocean. All the while, people are struggling. Hundreds of teenagers are still waiting over a year to get the help they need. 11 out of 14 health boards can't even meet the basic target. And Police Scotland has lost 200,000 working days from mental ill health. Does the First Minister accept that this draft mental health strategy, which is already a year late, needs a major rewrite? 
First Minister. Well, I think the problem for Willie Rennie here is that he is alleging that the mental health strategy doesn't cover this particular issue, but the mental health strategy hasn't actually been published yet. It will not be published until the new year. And we are taking time and care to make sure that the responses, some of which have been cited by Willie Rennie, uh, are properly taken into uh, account. In fact, I, I think the Health and Sport Committee of this very parliament asked that we didn't publish it until they had had the opportunity to properly feed into that process. Uh, you know, publishing a, a draft document for consultation is a normal part of the process in developing these strategies. Uh, and what we hear, the input we get from organisations like the one Willie Rennie has spoken about is a crucial part of making sure that when we do publish the final strategy, it does take account of these very important points. So I would encourage Willie Rennie and indeed any other member of this chamber to continue to play a constructive role in helping that on, us ensure that on this very, very important issue, we do get it right in all of these different aspects. And in terms of the general point, uh, about uh, CAMS, I, I've recognised before and continue to recognise the big challenge uh, that confronts us on this because of rising demand. But we are seeing, and we've got a lot of work still to do, we are seeing uh, rising numbers of uh, workers in this area. We are starting to see waiting times improve, although they've got an awful long way to go. Uh, we've got a lot to do, uh, but I think we're heading in the right direction and our mental health strategy will help us accelerate the pace of that. So when that's published in the new year, I hope that all members of the Chamber uh, will be able to get behind it because this is, as I've said before, one of the most important issues, not just for the government, but for all of our partners uh, working in this area uh, to get to grips with in the years to come. Some supplementaries now. First one from Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the focus of the Scottish Government's new international development strategy will be. First Minister. Our new international development strategy was published yesterday. It has at its core the aim of tackling global poverty, injustice and inequality, uh, working in partnership with others to achieve the UN global goals. Uh, since 2005, we have supported hundreds of projects delivering uh, health care, giving children access to education, families access to energy and support to gain employment to lift themselves out of poverty. The strategy will build on this work and will focus on four partner countries, Malawi, Zambia, Rwanda and Pakistan, to allow our funding to have a bigger impact on the lives of people we work with. Douglas Ross. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Last Thursday, thank you very much. Uh, last Thursday, the Cabinet Secretary provided me with a written answer about SPA committee meetings being held behind closed doors. The Cabinet Secretary said it was a matter for the SPA. Later that day, a member of the SPA raised their concerns about openness and transparency. Now, the HMICS report published about 90 minutes ago, which goes to 17 pages. Uh, if the First Minister has got to page five, however, she will have read that he questions the decision to hold committee meetings in private. What will the First Minister do to ensure that the SPA carry out their functions in ways that are proportionate, accountable and transparent, as required by the Police and Fire Reform Act, which her government passed? First Minister. Expect the SPA to take account of and make sure it implements the views and the recommendations of both uh, the Auditor General but also of Her Majesty's Inspectorate uh, of Constabulary. And that includes uh, the, the views that have been expressed in the report this morning around openness and transparency. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Given the unacceptable decision by Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board to close the inpatient facility at the Centre for Integrated Care, and that this is a decision under the original agreement that can only be taken by the Secretary of State for Scotland, now devolved to her government, will the First Minister now respect the decision of this Parliament in a vote to call this in and instruct the Health Secretary to stop hiding behind the board and call this in? First Minister. As uh, the member is aware, we take all of these decisions very seriously. We ask the Scottish Health Council uh, to inform decisions about what service changes or proposed service changes uh, are to be treated as major service changes and which do not require that. And we will continue to follow uh, that advice. And we will continue to make sure that we give support to local services, but also that we are supporting the reforms that are required in our health service to make sure uh, that patients across the country get the services that they're entitled to expect. Question number four, John Mason. Uh, to ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding the proposal by the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government that holders of public office should swear an oath to uphold 
British values. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government has had no communication from the UK Government in relation to the Secretary of State's uh, premature, in my view, response to the Casey report on social cohesion. Uh, we respect the work published by Dame Louise Casey into integration and opportunity, and the Scottish Government will certainly consider her suggestions carefully in terms of their relevance to Scotland. John Mason. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that answer. I mean, I wonder if the First Minister is actually any clearer than I am as to what British values actually are, and if everyone in Scotland should be expected to have them, because certainly I, for one, do not feel particularly British. First Minister. Well, I think, I think these are important, important issues. And as I said, we respect the work that's been carried out by Dame Louise Casey. I think it deserves to be given proper consideration. And I would suggest that the UK government should do the same, uh, commit to giving it proper consideration, rather than taking the premature step <coughs> of announcing that all public servants should be compelled to swear uh, an oath and risking, uh, and I, I do think it potentially risks the exclusion of people who do not define their values as uniquely uh, British. As a nation, and I, I hope some, this is something that all members across the chamber would agree with, as a nation, Scotland has a long history of welcoming people of all nationalities and all faiths, and we are committed to supporting their integration into our communities. Uh, not, in my view, through the swearing of oaths, but by creating a country where everyone has an opportunity to flourish and where diversity is truly welcomed and celebrated, where we judge people on the contribution they make to our country while they're here uh, and don't expect them to give up uh, their own identities and their own backgrounds in the process. Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I declare an interest as a member of District of Stirling Licensing Board? Um, I think a decade ago, none of us would have predicted the growth of online sales. Uh, sorry? No. Uh, sorry, I thought you were going to ask a supplementary in John Mason's question. This is a, a, supplement, a general supplementary, which I didn't take you for the previous time, so apologies. Okay. Okay. So I'm afraid you can't ask your question. I can't. <laughs> Good. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Russell will be happy with a very sympathetic response from the Chamber. Question number five, Liz Smith. <laughs> to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the call by the Association of Head Teachers and Deputies in Scotland for the extension of powers to head teachers. First Minister. That wherever possible decisions about children's learning should be decided at school level. Uh, we therefore welcome the response to the governance review from the Association of Head Teachers and Deputies in Scotland, <coughs> which proposes increasing the powers of our head teachers in order to have the biggest positive impact on learning, teaching, and outcomes for our children. The Scottish Government will, of course, consider all responses and contributions to our review into the governance of education in Scotland, which closes on the 6th of January. Liz Smith. I uh, thank the First Minister for that, and that's good to hear. Uh, the First Minister will, I am sure, acknowledge the very long-standing success of Jordan Hill School in Glasgow, but she will know too that a number of schools that want to adopt different uh, governance arrangements within the state sector face some constraints because this Parliament repealed the 1989 Self-Governing Schools Act. Will the First Minister confirm whether it is the Scottish Government's intention to amend the existing legislation to make it much easier to meet the growing demand for greater diversity in the state sector, the growing demand for head teachers for greater autonomy, and to give more powers to parents. First Minister. I think we've made very clear uh, our desire to see more power lie with head teachers and individual schools. That indeed is the presumption that lies at the very heart of the, the governance review. Uh, that said, John Swinney also made it very clear when he launched the governance review that we also uh, believe that local councils should continue to have democratic oversight and accountability for education. But uh, I absolutely want to make sure that the steps we take are guided uh, by the need to raise standards and close the attainment gap, not by ideology on one side or the other. That's why we've set up the governance review. It's why we will listen uh, to all contributions made to the governance review. Uh, it closes, as I said, on the 6th of January. We'll take time to consider those contributions and John Swinney will then set out our plans, including whether there is any requirement for legislative change after that. Julian Martin. 
Thank you, President Officer. I welcome uh, the First Minister's acknowledgement of the pivotal role that head teachers play in providing leadership in schools across my constituency and indeed the whole of Scotland. Can she advise what the Scottish Government is doing currently to strengthen school leadership and to invest in head teachers' skills and professional development? First Minister. Well, strengthening leadership was a key recommendation of the OECD's review of Scottish education and the changes we are proposing in the consultation on the standard for headship uh, are intended to do that. Uh, this will enable that future head teachers have the leadership skills and support they need, uh, while the draft regulations give education authorities flexibility to deal with individual local circumstances, uh, particularly in relation to temporary appointments. We absolutely recognise the importance of educational leadership and we're committed to supporting teachers who want to take the step into headship. That's why we're funding the new into headship qualification at a cost of up to £1.5 million uh, to 2018. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 18 out of 29 head teachers in Shetland already teach pupils in classrooms. They struggle to find enough time in the day as it is. So, if the government plan to give head teachers more responsibilities, what part of their workload will go? First Minister. I think there is a strong desire on the part of head teachers to have the greater responsibility that we are talking about. But I absolutely recognise, and I don't think John Swinney could have been any clearer since he took up the post of Education Secretary about the need to make sure we address issues of excessive workload on the part of teachers. That's why steps have been taken to reduce unnecessary workload and bureaucracy. I also would acknowledge very much that in, in rural and island areas in particular, uh, that may be a particular challenge that we've got to address. And I'm sure uh, John Swinney would be happy to discuss that directly with Tavish Scott. So all of these issues are ones that we will take into account. Uh, but our absolute determination, as I've said many, many times over the course of this year, and we'll continue to do so as we go into next year, our determination is to raise standards in our schools and to close the attainment gap. And I believe one of, not the only way, but one of the ways of doing that is to support leadership in our schools and then give the leaders in our schools the ability, the powers and uh, the freedoms to get on with the jobs that they do best. Question number six, Pauline McNeill. Presiding officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the number of destitute people sleeping on Scotland's streets this Christmas. First Minister. As long as there is, uh, in my view, one person uh, sleeping rough on our streets, not just at Christmas, but at any time of the year, then that is one person too many. The number of homeless people reporting that they had slept rough before applying for housing support has decreased every year for the past five years in Scotland. Uh, however, we do know that only those who approach local authorities are recorded. Uh, that's why we're working with stakeholders to gather more robust data on the figures of those rough sleeping and to assess their often very complex needs so that we can continue to take action that will support people to move off the streets and into a home of their own. Pauline McNeill. Thank the First Minister for that answer. It is a sad fact that there will be many people sleeping rough this Christmas uh, across our streets, a visible scourge on our society. And the figures I have showed that last year there's a dramatic increase on rough sleeping. The City Mission in Glasgow and the Bethany Trust in Edinburgh show that this trend is likely to continue, as we know from press reports that they're turning people away from their night shelters. There seems to be a severe shortage for women of emergency accommodation for some reason. Can I ask the First Minister she look at two areas of government policy in this regard? Would she consider initiating a national coordination to ensure that there is provision for women in emergency night shelters, at least until we can eradicate rough sleeping and homelessness? And secondly, would she also look at a model which is adopted in Nordic countries and also used in Glasgow of Housing First, which is simply a model which provides quickly uh, accommodation, permanent homes, but importantly, it wraps the services around the person's particular problems, which may be the problems that have led them to homelessness in the first place. And I think that's certainly a policy worth looking at. First Minister. Um, can I thank Polly McNeill for raising uh, this issue and also for the constructive suggestion she's made. I will absolutely uh, consider both of the points that she has made. I think the point she makes, particularly around access to night shelters for women, uh, is an important one. Uh, on the second point about uh, the, the housing first model, that is something that uh, 
we are very open to looking into, although some of our local authorities will already use a model that is uh, not dissimilar in some respects to the housing options work that they do. Uh, the new moderator of the Church of Scotland, uh, after he took office, actually specifically asked that we looked at this particular model and I gave him a commitment that we would do so. What is absolutely true, and I think Polly McNeill's uh, question goes to the heart of this is that people who find themselves rough sleeping uh, will very often be people whose needs are not just accommodation needs they have accommodation needs but they will have very complex multifaceted uh, needs as well so we have to look at tackling the problem in that holistic way um, I also think it's important I made this point in my first answer the official statistics would say that rough sleeping has been reducing but we do know that the official statistics will not necessarily tell the whole story which is why we're working with partners to try to get more robust data so I'm happy to give a commitment to look into uh, both of the points uh, raised by Polly McNeill as I said on the latter one we have already been doing that and to report back to her in the new year. Question number seven, Edward Mountain. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to support the Christmas tree industry. First Minister. <laughs> Uh, well, <laughs> well, personally, I am delighted that there are uh, two homegrown uh, trees in Butte House uh, this Christmas. And uh, I would encourage people, if they haven't already bought their Christmas tree for this Christmas, to consider buying a Scottish grown tree. And if they have already bought their tree, uh, to consider that for next Christmas. Uh, there is an important point behind this question, actually. The Christmas tree industry is a privately funded sector, uh, but we are absolutely committed as a government to uh, continued investment in Scotland's wider forestry sector, which is a really important part of our economy. The draft budget protects funding for forestry and increases the money available for forestry grants in uh, next, the next financial year to £40 million. Edward Mountain. I thank the First Minister for her answer and I'm delighted that she has brought two Christmas trees and I hope they are indeed Scottish trees because over 55% of the UK Christmas trees are produced in Scotland, many on the Black Isle, an area which I represent. But we still import over 2 million Christmas trees into the UK every year, so there is more to do. But as the First Minister pointed out, as the First Minister pointed out, it's not just Christmas trees that are important to Scotland. Commercial forestry is as well, especially if we're to meet Scotland's timber needs and the government's environmental targets. The SNP have missed its planting targets for the last three years. I think we should hear Mr. Martin's question, please. I'll repeat that just in case you didn't get it the first time. The SNP have missed their planting targets for the last three years. Does the First Minister really believe that the additional £4 million announced in the budget will be enough to make up the shortfall, which no one else believes it will, to hit the target of 100,000 hectares of planting by 2020? First Minister. The Tory spending commitments are really piling up today, aren't they? Unfortunately, they, they are relying on Santa to deliver them the resources they need to fund them. Um, Look, there are important issues in this question. Uh, I can confirm, as I think I did in my previous answer, but if I didn't, I apologise, that the Christmas trees in Butte House are Scottish-grown Christmas trees. Um, I, I cannot, uh, I, I cannot uh, insist that people across the country buy homegrown Christmas trees, but I would encourage them to do so because it's good for that sector of our economy. In terms of our own uh, planting targets, we are absolutely prioritising the action to increase the scale and pace of new woodland creation, and that's absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, so I hope everybody, uh, as we go into the Christmas holidays, enjoys their Christmas tree, wherever in the UK or elsewhere it happens to have been grown. We do have a final contribution from Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the spirit of Christmas, which Edward Mountain was so uncharacteristically lacking in, and on the subject of trees, I wonder if the First Minister would join me in welcoming this week's community buyout of the historic Loch Arcaig Pine Forest as another step along the road towards Scotland's land being owned for the benefit of the many, not the few, something we know the Tories are so supportive of. <laughs> Well, we know that 
the Tories really don't like this principle of for the many rather than the few. <laughs> but nevertheless, I think it's one we should support. I, I do welcome uh, very much the community buyout, which has been achieved by the local community trust working with Woodland Trust Scotland. Uh, the 2,500 acres of Loch Archaig Forest form one of only 38 Caledonian pinewood inventory sites in Scotland. And these are vital native ancient pinewoods. So it is really good to see the local community coming together to work with other agencies uh, on a long-term plan to conserve and restore them. As I say, I think the Tories are demonstrating they don't like the idea of land being owned by the many, not the few, but this government is determined to continue down that road and since that was the final contribution in the absence of uh, Christmas spirit from elsewhere in the chamber presiding officer can I end by wishing you a very happy Christmas. <laughs>